Yeah, so um, I guess I want to start with a little bit of like where I came from and um, yeah, I guess I've sort of always um, been like, you know, making art as like a hobby on the side, like in high school, I would just like find, um, it was this old like Mackie like mixing board and, and our like in this TV like studio we had in our high school and I would just fuck with that for hours and just play with it and try to make it make uh, these like awful noisy like sounds. Kind of like this I guess. Um, is there sound? Jordan? Uh, yeah, there should be. Really? Uh, <laughs> In general, I think, you know, I didn't quite know it at the time, but I was interested in, like, finding the limits of, like, um, technology and computers and, like, pushing them beyond where they were intended to be uh, used. And um, to me, that was art. That was, like, I wasn't really ever into drawing or painting or really much of anything else uh, in the art world. But um, to me, this was, like, how I was exploring like, new ideas and whatever. Um, and then I got to college and I started programming. I decided that I was going to be a computer programmer and like uh, change the world in that way and be like, um, you know, I thought computers were a really promising like uh, frontier and I wanted to study them and get really good at them and help make the world a better place. And um, in the meantime, I, I sort of like would use my like programming skills to make, um, you know, I guess what you call now like generative artwork or like interactive computer artwork. And, um, you know, at the time, I didn't really like art that much. I didn't really like the art world. I didn't really understand why it was so like closed off. And so this is sort of clearly a reflection of that. It's like interactive. You make the art. The audience, the audience, and the artist are sort of like merged. And um, I also kind of thought that like visual art was dead um, because computers were gonna like destroy it. <laughs> and um, I think, uh, yeah. I mean, I thought that like. Because any painting could be represented on a computer, that meant that a computer could technically randomly generate that painting. Uh, and so why paint anymore? Because a computer has already theoretically already painted it for you. <laughs> so that's what this piece is about. It's like generating random art. Obviously, I mean, this would never generate every painting by any means. But um, there are artists who address that. How do I switch out of this? This might be complicated. Um, there are artists that are addressing, that were addressing this. Um, there's this piece called Every Icon, that actually I didn't know about at the time. I kind of wish I was like more into art because I didn't want to hurt about it. But <laughs> um, I guess I'll just search for Every Icon. Uh, here it is. Search on Google. <laughs> So yeah, this is basically a website it was made in 1997 by this guy John F. Simon Jr. And uh, over the course of, I think it's like the next like 500 billion years, it will have generated every um, possible uh, monochrome icon that could be used for like, you know, a software program, uh, 32 by 32 icon. Um, so even though I didn't know it, there were like real legitimate artists talking about this kind of stuff. So um, back to the PowerPoint. Yeah, so that's what I was into, and um, as I continued, I ended up like going through college and uh, becoming like a programmer and all that. And uh, I worked for Google for a while and was like pretty upset being there. Um, it was like really just super corporate and boring. And um, in the meantime, I would sort of make stuff like this. Um, this was a website at the time. Like, um, it's all JavaScript. And uh, at the time, you couldn't really do much with JavaScript, and I was pretty proud that I had made it, you know, make this like visual art. Um, and it says Carmel Electra. And after that, I sort of like, you know, messed around and stuff like that. And, uh, and then I started just in my personal life getting like super political, and I was like living in San Francisco, and I was like working for the man, and I just like uh, couldn't help but feel like the world was like a really, uh, in a really dire place. And um, 
that's where I was at. And I was like listening to Democracy Now! and like reading all these anarchist like, newspapers, and I was just getting really into that. And um, I didn't really think art really had a place in that. Um, but I made these bumper stickers, and I thought they were kind of funny, and I would like, go into the rich neighborhood of, um, next to San Francisco and put them on people's like luxury cars. Um, and they just say, I don't know if you can read them, but they say like McCain Biden, Palin Palin, McCain Obama. Um, those are like official campaign stickers, and I just thought that was funny. And you know, I was kind of trying to say that maybe like the candidates aren't that different from each other, and you know, the two-party system and how like branding has become such an important part of um, the election uh, process, and how like these tiny changes to these logos kind of make them look really foreign and really weird. Um, and uh, people would ask me why I was doing it, and I would say that I wished, I just wish that we went back to the days when the person who got the most votes uh, became president, the person who got the second highest number of votes became vice president, which is how it worked for like the first couple decades of, of America. Um, which is funny in a two-party system, because now you just every single time have both parties in the way. Anyway, um, and then I decided I was into stickers. <laughs> and, um, these are stickers that I would hand out, um, and they said things like free, do not eat, uh, not tested on humans, uh, stuff like that. And I would hand them out, and the idea was that you were supposed to you know, go and put them on stuff at the grocery store. And uh, it was sort of like me exploring the idea of like, propaganda. Like, I was essentially making propaganda. Because um, through all my, like, you know, being really political and like, whatever, I started realizing that like, I just actually don't really think that protest does anything. Um, I don't really think it's like a viable way to um, change like people's minds or change policy or anything like that. And I sort of started deciding that, uh, you know, art creates culture and people are really just influenced by what they see. And so I was like, experimenting with like, well, you know, people love stickers. <laughs> Why don't I just sort of you know, I want to see these stickers on in all sorts of grocery stores on every single product, so why don't I just like give them to people and see if they put them on? Um, and so that was me making like propaganda. Um, then a lot of stuff happened. I left Google and I stopped being so NXT and um, I moved here. Um, you know, not for any particular reason, just because like everyone that I knew and cared about was here. <laughs> and I was like, I pretty much like retired from Google. Um, and I could just live here and didn't have to worry about a job for a while. And uh, so I thought Baltimore perfect. Um, I can like live for free, basically, because nothing costs anything here. And, um, and so, yeah, and then I just started, I guess I uh, moved in with Alan Resnick, and he was just constantly on the computer making all, living all this crazy art and making all this computer art, and I realized that I had really missed this whole period of computer art that um, was actually really exciting and people were doing a lot of really fun stuff. Um, and yeah, I totally missed out. And so I started, you know, playing around and making stuff. And uh, I decided um, I made this video. And I guess my thing was, you know, I thought that computer art. I think in general, this is a conflict for me. I think that computers are like pretty uh, amazing and powerful, and uh, really have the power to change our lives in, in these amazing ways. But they're also like uh, pretty like awful and using like like computer art is mostly used for like horrible shit. Like most computer art that people see is TV commercials where there's like balls fluttering around and it says like MTV and MTV like melts into like a I don't know beach ball and then condoms float out. I don't really know, but it's just like there, there's all these just awful awful art being in computers. And for some reason, like fine artists aren't really taking it up as much. Um, so this piece here was just me kind of trying to explore like, um, you know, kind of like looks like advertising E. It has like the really clean, like soft, like smooth look, and there's things moving around the screen. And um, but I want to explore like the subject matter. Um, you know, this isn't really subject matter that's normally uh, addressed in that kind of work. And um, yeah, I think maybe it was just me. You know, maybe I would have wanted to build this sculpture in your life, but I couldn't because I don't know how to do anything. Um, so I did it on the computer. And um, I don't really think this is like a great piece. It was just, it was me like exploring that, and, like whether a computer can just be another medium, uh, or whether it is like steeped in people's like preconceptions about what 
for the animation is like four. Um, and then I'm going to get to these later. Um, I got pretty obsessed with creating like lifelike simulations of, um, I guess, like advertising banners. And I just, I, this is still like a preoccupation of mine. I don't really know what to do with it. I take lots of pictures and video of like grand opening banners and like car, like used car lot banners. And I just think they're kind of like disgusting and weird. Um, but, and at the time, I guess like, I was looking at some like text artists, like, um, you know, Jenny Holzer, I feel like a lot of you probably know. Um, oh, shit. Um, anyway, like Jenny Holzer um, would make, you know, she'd write these like little sentences or little blurby things. Um, and then project them on the buildings, or uh, you know, she got a lot of like space in like New York City, um, and you know, they would say things like money creates taste. And I thought it was neat that she was you know saying all these like vaguely political things, um, without really saying anything, but just sort of like opening that up, like making you wonder like you know what what the words meant, what those sentences meant, who, what kind of voice was telling you those things. Um, and also like Barbara Kruger, I thought was pretty cool. Um, let's see, I have her stuff in a tab here. It's pretty hard to see these tabs now. Um, you guys all know Barbara Kruger. She's all over. And uh, she was doing something similar, like using text uh, in this sort of like advertising, like public way, I guess. And. Um, yeah, I just thought that was cool. So I have these banners, but I'm gonna, I guess, get to them later. Um, and this was also me exploring, uh, like, photorealism. I guess I decided that, um, I thought it was a neat, I just decided it was neat that I could just lie to people. I could just make it unclear whether something was real or not. Um, and, you know, I, it's kind of like a, a burden a little bit because people are pretty confused about how I made this. They think that, like, I actually made this and threw rocks at it, and then somehow like digitally removed the strings that were holding it up or something. Um, but in reality, it's all just it's it, well, you know, I created it in, in a three D program and uh, did like a simu physics simulation to make it look like it was blowing in the wind. And I'll get back to those. Um, <laughs> um, I guess I'm gonna stop for a second. Does anyone have any questions? I feel like I'm going a little fast because I want to leave some time at the end for questions, but. Um, is there anything anyone wants to know about the medium, about why you decided that art could like matter? Like, well, like I wanted to know about how you made that banner that you were designing, but then you just said that you would tell us later. Yeah, it's hard because the I just I don't really want to give a demo, like a tech demo while I'm up here, but maybe if you guys want to see that, I could try to find. I mean, it's just like, you know, you just do it in the way that you would in the real world. Like I took a uh, 3D version of a flat like a uh, plane, like a plank of wood. And then I said it's not wood, it's fabric. And then I tied some invisible ropes to the ends. And then I put a, a big fan that you can't see. And then I turned the fan on and it blew the fan. And this is all on the computer. All on the computer. <laughs> exactly. It, it was using uh, the, a mouse and uh, the keyboard. <laughs> all right. Um, yeah. I, uh, I guess I should get more into the technical. I don't know. <laughs> I can talk about I can talk more about that later, for real, later in the, in the lecture. Um, all right, so then I sort of, um, my love really uh, is like finding, just like fucking with computers and like finding stuff um, that is just unexpected. Like I think, I mean, computers obviously um, there are a lot of like new aesthetics being created by computers all the time, like data moshing, which is um, what was in that Kanye West video where everything's all blocky and blotchy and like moves around the screen in this weird way. They're just like computers have the ability to like constantly create something new um, and something you've never seen before that because a human didn't make it, a computer just for some reason through some error or whatever, uh, it made this image. 
So I made this video. Oh. Lisa Morales, show off your bikini. Hey guys, what's up? I'm Bikini Comp Supermodel Lisa Morales, and I'm here to show off my bikini. Actually, fill it in with sort of like what it thinks. Um, how, do, how do you open this? Okay. Um, it, it'll try to fill it in with. Uh, it just tries to guess what you would want in that space. Um, and so there are a lot of artists. I mean, artists just people went crazy with this, which is pretty exciting. Um, and this is just one example. Um, someone took the Mona Lisa and just deleted the figure of the Mona Lisa from it, and the computer filled in, like it looks pretty seamless, um, the computer just filled in what it thought might go there, based on its like artificial intelligence like algorithms. Um, and so I realized that I could do that uh, and fill in the bikini parts with, um, I guess, like flesh. Like, so I was sort of like taking off this woman's bikini. Uh, so I could see what was underneath, and the computer was like, you know, deciding what was underneath, and um, and then I realized I could do the same with the background, and I could, you know, have it replace the background with um, whatever it thought should go there, and so that's how we got that like awful like flesh thing, and um, yeah, to me, I mean, that was the process, and then I started like wondering like why am I so interested in this, <laughs> like, what's up with that, and. Um, I started thinking that, like, I guess um, I had heard once that, um, you know, like, we all know Blu rays. Um, for a while, like, when people were starting to get bored with DVDs, they were like, well, we need a new standard for HD. And so they had um, Blu ray and HD DVD, and those were the two standards. And um, it was actually the porn industry that decided that. Um, that Blu-ray was going to be the winner because actually the porn industry produces like 10 times as many DVDs as Hollywood. Um, and so I was just thinking about that and I just thought that was crazy like as like an, like an alien anthropologist or something coming to Earth, you'd be like, yeah, they have these little discs and like pretty much they're just like almost all of them contain just pictures of naked women. Uh, and that's apparently why they invented them, we don't really get it. Um, and I just thought that was interesting and I guess like I have a lot of issues with pornography, I don't really like it, I think it's kind of like bad for the world or whatever. Um, and but I, I guess I thought it was interesting to like create this like new kind of porn just to see how what that felt like. And because I always think about like um, I don't know if you guys know Eli Roth, he's a like horror director. He made like Hostel and all those like it's called like torture porn now. Um, 
And I saw an interview with him once where this guy from like Fox News was like, why are you so evil? And, um, and he was like, you know, he was saying like, we live in a really violent world. Um, you know, people are dying every day in our name as Americans. Um, and there's all this violence around us, but we don't see it. And he's really just trying to bring that to light. And um, essentially participate in it to critique it. Um, and I guess that's sort of what led me to be okay with like making this and continuing this series. Um, is the idea that like maybe I maybe by participating in something you think is kind of wrong or bad, you can like help create dialogue around it. Um, I don't really know if that's if that's really the, what is happening with these pieces. My mom saw them and we got kind of upset. Um, but <laughs> Um, so, moving on, I guess I have this clear interest in technology, and uh, I wanted to use that Photoshop effect. Um, essentially, well, I heard I, I heard once that Seinfeld, I mean, apparently used to be shot on film, um, not on, um, you know, not on video. So, like, theoretically, it could like come out later in HD, which I think now it has. Um, but I guess I thought it'd be funny. To, uh, to just convert it myself using the Photoshop feature. So basically Photoshop has this feature where not only can it, it fill in spots that you want to delete, but it can also, um, if you want to just make something, like change the aspect ratio of something, uh, it will try to fill in stuff so that the, the image still makes sense to our, our eyes. And so basically I just upscaled this from its original like, eight, uh, standard definition size uh, up to HD and made it widescreen. And, um, and I call it Seinfeld HD. Uh, and I really honestly wish it was re released. Uh, oh, but... Did she even ask you what you were doing tomorrow night if you were busy? No. She calls you today, she doesn't make a plan for tomorrow? What is that? It's Saturday night. Yeah. What is that? It's ridiculous. You don't even know what hotel she's staying at. You can't call her. That's a signal, Jerry. That's a signal. <laughs> So that is just sort of like, you know, a little gimmicky, like, uh, you know, it's just like interesting to look at. There's really nothing conceptual there. But um, I think in general, like, the theme that I was starting to think about is like, um, sort of technology going to waste. Uh, so I have this, like, um, you know, love hate relationship with technology. Like, I'm pretty pushy about technology. I send my friends really annoying emails all the time about it. Um, and I'm always like, oh, you know, you should get, you should upgrade your iTunes, stuff like that. And, uh, but at the same time, I like, totally hate it. I think it's like destroying the planet. Um, and I don't have a totally reconciled those two yet. But um, I guess on the side of like loving technology, uh, I think it is kind of a shame that um, you know people are so scared. They think it's magic, and they don't really realize that it, it really isn't, and that it's pretty straightforward. Uh, and it could really help you know just people out a lot in many different ways. But I guess this is also related to the um, the whole like. Uh, porn thing, like Blu-ray thing. Uh, it's just funny how technology kind of so easily goes to waste. Um, you know, people like the iPad comes out and it's like this, I don't know, kind of cool machine. And uh, it sort of enables like a lot of new ways of approaching things and blah, blah, blah. And uh, people buy to play Angry Birds. Um, people buy to play like dumb games that they could already play. You know, like it's just like a total waste. And I feel like the ways the technology is not really the things living up to its potential are just like endless. I um, don't even know where to begin with that. So I thought it'd be interesting to like just intentionally waste uh, technology, like to use it for something completely pointless um, and arbitrary, like converting something into HD when that's a impossible and b it looks insane. <laughs> um, okay. and, uh, and that leads me into this next piece, which um, is, I guess, ongoing. Uh, I've been collecting photographs of people who are taking photos, um, usually with their cell phones. And um, yeah, I think basically, I just think this is, this is interesting. Uh, it's like a comment on uh, people misusing technology, you use technology for anything. You know, uh, 
And I, I don't think that people invented photographs so that uh, you can take pictures of people taking photographs. Um, and, you know, so this is just bits of that. Um, all right. So, on top of all that, I also have last year developed this fascination with outsider 3D animation. Um, there's some pretty incredible stuff happening in that world. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit of it. Um, I think I have a tab, but I just can't read what they say. Oh, this is it. This is it. There's this lady, Wendy, who I just re I'm really obsessed with. Um, yeah, well, it's just like there's been this huge overflowing of. Um, Wendy and her virtual sister, Karen Adanti. Like people, 
Like I'm excited about fine artists starting to use like 3D animation software. Um, I haven't really shown them enough of that. I had some ads open, but um, I'm also really excited about like just these tools being accessible because anyone who has a computer can do this stuff. Um, and everybody, like, so many people have to do this in this country. Um, I just find that really exciting. And I really do think that, um, you know, now that, like, kids are drawing on, like, iPads and, you know, there's some computer art going on in school, I'm kind of excited that maybe it'll be considered, like, a legitimate art form in, like, 10 years or so. Um, so, <laughs> I'm going to skip over that. Um, what's that? That was that. Um, I guess I felt like I had to talk about the banners um, a little bit more. Um, the, the sort of work I was looking at when I was making this stuff is um, Craig. This guy, I think, is kind of neat. Um, this is a, a piece of his, like a you know, 3D uh, rendered, uh, just like curtain. And uh, I guess what I like about artists like this is um, they're really treating this as a medium uh, and not as, you know, like new media. It's not like new media art. It's not like check out what I did with this technology. It's just like, you know, I, I don't really know this artist. I don't know what they're all about. Um, but I get the impression that they, you know, this is just their medium of choice and these are the things that they wanted to represent with it. And, um, you know, this medium is the 3D stuff, you know, every car commercial you see, every, like, just everything you see at this point ha has been touched by 3D animation, like, almost every movie, even movies you would never expect, um, you know, they can't shoot everything in the locations that they want to, so they make up, you know, parts of locations called set extension. But, um, yeah, so I like that um, some people are, like, taking the medium and not doing what is done with it in mass media, like using it to make flashy things, like really like things that are fantastical in these really boring ways. Um, these are not fantastical at all. Um, it's just like a trash can tipped over. And um, there really isn't too much, isn't too much work like this. Um, even now, I mean, people are starting to realize that they can uh, use 3D animation as a, a medium, but it's, it's, you know, being out here really slowly. Um, and what are the other tabs? Let me just go through my tabs. Oh, that's something else. Um, this is another person using the medium. Like, there's something really, like, the aesthetics, I was just, like, how many of you ever seen, like, a beautiful, like, 
advertising banner. I don't think Dina has. I know, and I do the people too, but in, they're like, they're gross, we see them all the time. And we can't avoid looking at them. Um, and I just think that's funny, and like, where's like putting a flag, or putting a flag on the moon is like a statement of like power and like authority. And, um, and they're just so weird, like what is their, what, I don't know what they are to us. Are they supposed to, is, do we relate to them because they look like skin? Because you would like, uh, like scalp your, like, in like a tribal environment, you would like take your enemy's skin and like put it on a pole. Like where does this come from? What other like ripply things do you like put on a pole? I just don't really understand where it comes from and why it has so it's a power in our culture and culture in the world. And um, on top of that, I, I guess, you know, when I was making these, I was like, um, getting back into politics, I guess, and I was like watching a lot of Daily Show and like um, pres watching all the presidential campaigns, and um, I just thought these like words were kind of interesting. Um, and like you saw earlier, like freedom from, I feel like everybody's always talking about freedom, but freedom means different things to different people, and it's like freedom from what? Um, that's the obvious, obvious. Um, and world, and these are all just like these really powerful words that I almost feel like have no meaning to us anymore. Uh, and I want to explore that. Um, acknowledging it's everything, that maybe there's a word after it, I don't know. Um, so yeah, I'm going through a lot at you. I have like a lot of disparate interests. Um, but uh, if you guys have any FAQs, um, I'd love to answer. Tim. Um, you're, I believe, in a graduate program at Towson University. Yeah. Uh, what we have a degree in, and um, not that not this matters all that much, but what, 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 what would one be able to do with said degree? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Right, I forgot to mention I, I am, right, I'm in the MFA program with Jordan and Steve um, at uh, Towson. And um, I guess for me, that was like a move towards like taking this stuff more seriously and um, you know, I made art my whole life and never really realized that I liked art or that I could call things art. And, uh, you know, now I, I want to take it seriously and be critical. Like, I think that um, art is like a really powerful like medium for change and for like dialogue. And in the end, like, uh, I think what the world needs a lot of right now is dialogue. Um, so, yeah, the MFA, I mean, I don't really know what I'm going to end up doing with like, uh, this like Google background and the undergraduate computer science and the MFA. Um, I I love computers and I'm like never gonna be able to to give them up and I'll probably need to be like a coder like writing code for my whole life. Um, but I found that like culture in that world like really boring. So I'm somehow hoping that uh, with the MFA I'll be able to find a more interesting um, career. More questions. Oh, come. <laughs> how, how exactly? Um, so you said you, you're going to continue being a coder when you still want to incorporate this kind of stuff. So is there some sort of like way of coding art? Well, I guess what direction do you? Um, how are you? Then? You want me? You're just expanding on Tim's question. Uh, well, so, well, like I, I guess I'm sort of thinking to myself. <laughs> well, it's funny, I mean, honestly, I think it's all really confusing why there's, like, I know of one uh, performance artist who writes code on stage, and I just can't believe, like, literally, seriously, almost everything that we do is mediated through by software, and yet it's like, not only are there almost no software artists, um, there is nearly zero so uh, art that is about software. I don't, I don't really get that. Um, it's pretty rare that something is like so pervasive in our culture and no one talks about it in art. I think that's odd. Um, but as for me, I mean, I don't really know. Like, uh, this for me is more of like a personal exploration into uh, art. And, um, you know, it's still like two years away. And uh, I'm not super concerned with that. <laughs> that's my answer, sorry. Does anyone else have any questions? So I don't want to know how stuff is made. That's going to be a while. It, it would yeah. be a while. <laughs> um, 
Um, yeah, let me, I'll show you a little screenshot. I was gonna do my lecture in Cinema 4D, which is what I use. Um, I'm gonna use a bunch of software, but um, I didn't, I just the PowerPoint was really easy. Um, what was I gonna do? Oh, yeah. I have, where do I have these? Um, I had some screenshots of my like process that I thought maybe I would need and then I just forgot to look at. But like, this was me working on a flag and <laughs> pole. Um, you be, literally, like all that stuff that I said you had to do, like as if it was in real life, you basically do. Like I don't know if you ever heard this funny anecdote about how when they were making the Incredibles, the movie, the Pixar movie, um, the main character, I don't remember his name, but his pants kept falling down. And uh, they literally just had to build him a belt, like to get the character's pants to stop falling down. <laughs> <laughs> because at this point, like to make something look realistic and fluid, you need, like the computer needs to simulate the physics, like the physical, um, uh, the way things collide with each other, the way that, um, uh, cloth moves, the way that liquid moves, stuff like that. Um, so I actually made this little like hook up here, and I had this uh, counterweight right here that was pulling down the flag, and then the flag, this is the flag. I don't remember what I thought I was gonna say, but I gave up because it, it looked bad and didn't work. Um, but yeah, and it was gonna slowly like pull it up, and it was gonna be like pulling the flag up, the flag pull. Uh, and then later on you render it, and you, you know, you can download, um, uh, these like 360 like panoramas of like skies or like cities or just fucking everything. And you can just immediately like put your thing in that environment and it lights it as if it's in there and it like casts shadows as if it's in that environment. Um, and then it just looks like it's there. So that is like really in a nutshell how it all works. Uh, I mean I could give, I mean I teach like middle schoolers how to do this and it takes a week just to get to like here, <laughs> but um, yeah, my opinion. Well, I don't know about the experience, but did you, do you draw, is there like a database for these objects, or do you draw each object and then like apply the physics to them? Like would you draw that fan and tell the story? Right, it's more like there's a menu, and you pick from the menu, like I want a fan, I want a uh, turbulent fan, it's going to create lots of like uh, particles moving in different ways. Um, is you can it say, possible? is it what? Is it possible to, make to just draw stuff. Honestly, drawing is not like a big part of the software. Um, in general, uh, I've seen, I saw once like a three D modeling program that used drawing. Uh, it was pretty awesome. You like draw on a two D, you like draw a two D drawing, and then you have a trackball. And you rotate the trackball slightly, and then you draw it again, like a new profile, and then you rotate it slightly, and you draw it again, and then eventually it like builds a 3D model of that. But it's analogous to drawing. So it's like what you're doing, like you're building. I think it's more analogous to sculpture. Okay. I don't think you're drawing, yeah. But um, oh, what was I going to show you next? Oh, this is a website that I use a lot. Um, the Google 3D Warehouse. There's also one called Turbo Squid. They're both good for different purposes. Um, but you can look for like um, yeah. urinal. I think someone had to do Sean Urinal here. Maybe they took it down. Um, but you can like take the, the Duchamp like file and print it out and 3D print it and put it in 3D. Scene. But there's just these are just things that people have uploaded. Like they modeled them by hand, which is like a really insane process, and I hate doing it. And it's hard. Um, but uh, yeah, they modeled it and then they just upload it. And these are all free. You just download this and then you can immediately just throw it into your scene. It's like The Sims. Um, and so I use this website a lot. I use this other website, uh, cgtextures.com. Uh, let's say you want, I don't know, you want to make like a concrete building. There's 257 different kinds of concrete you can pick from. Uh, and then you just throw these onto your model and it looks like concrete. Um, and they have like floors, fabric, food, uh, landscapes, nature, ornaments, plaster, plastic, roads, rock, and so on. So you can kind of like, you don't even have to know too much about um, 3D modeling to be able to make something that 
at least like looks on par with like a video game from the lab from like five years ago. Um, in terms of like the quality of the textures and like the resolution of the models and stuff like that. Um, does that answer your question? Um, um, any other questions? Comment. <laughs> this is probably the last question we can you can take. Didn't you recently actually like for having that is a good point. I, I kind of did want to show this um, this piece. It won't, it won't take long, but um, I've been trying to do a little more programming because everyone I talk to is like, "Oh my God, you work for Google. You should totally do some software art." And I honestly just find this stuff pretty uninspiring and boring because um, usually it's like um, an artist learning how to program, and they're like, "Look what I did." And I'm like, "Yeah, that's kind of not that interesting." And they're like, "But I did it. It took me a long time." And I'm like, "I'm sorry. It's okay." But um, I'm trying to do this. Um, I'll just show it to you. Um, basically, I, I use like a lot of different techniques to um, generate this 3D scene that I then rendered out. And I simulated uh, the way photons move through space, um, like light particles. Um, and they would like randomly hit certain colored lights and then hit the camera. So they would generate either red, green, or blue uh, pixels. And, um, and then I used this like computer vision technique that is used for, um, I don't know, what's computer, what is like uh, optical flow used for? Detecting like motion changes. Yeah, like, like a person is like moving over, you can detect. Right, like detecting movement and like finding out like if someone's holding like uh, a, uh, but you know when like on, on the Super Bowl they like overlay stuff onto the field? Like they're using this kind of motion tracking stuff. Um, I know that doesn't seem obvious for the piece because I'm using it for something different. Um, but anyway, I'm using all this technology and eventually what I want this piece to be is instead of this video, um, I actually want it to be a blog which I had open um, right here. It's going to be a blog that basically uh, computes the next uh, frame every six hours um, on this like server in California uh, that Amazon runs and like sells uh, and sell time to people. Um, so basically I'm having a computer like use um, this like military and, and like uh, yeah just really like high tech industrial technology to um, generate this sort of like color field artwork. So I am trying to write more software. I've gotten over my you know, Google kind of made it software programming not that fun for me, and I'm finding my way back into it. Um, but I guess it's a good place to, to end the, the lecture because this is what I'm working on currently. So, thanks everyone.